An architect is developing a 330-acre site with the goal for the entire site of 20 units per acre. He's developed 75 acres of the site so far at 15 units per acre. What should the density be in units per acre for the remaining not yet developed portion? And you have a choice 16, 18, 20, or 21. The correct answer is 21. More on that in a little bit. So today we're talking about exam hacks and some study hacks. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's the ones that I think are probably the most useful. And I suspect I know more about which exam hacks are the most useful probably than anyone in the world, or certainly than almost anyone in the world. Um, but there's a reason that this is our 158th uh, uh, 40 Minutes of Competence, and it's our first one dedicated to exam hacks. <laughs> um, and that's because on this particular exam, there really aren't many hacks. I mean, the content is the hack. And you guys have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. Um, no, people don't fail these exams because they don't understand the right hack. Uh, people fail these exams because they don't know the answer to the question, not because they're nervous about the test generally, not because NCARB has a funny way of wording it, not because NCARB's way is different than the rest of the practice way. I mean, all those things are reasons why you might get a question or two wrong um, or feel a little extra anxiety. But generally, I have found that that when I talk to people who fail the test, um, especially if they fail pretty badly, uh, they generally don't seem to know the content as well as they need to. Second hack. Um, math multiple choice and the smell test. So this question that we did, you don't have to do any, uh, you don't have to do any um, uh, math to answer it. So, and the reason is because, and this is actually, uh, this happens all the time on the exam. Um, those of you guys who have taken the exams know that if there's a math problem, probably 60% of the time, it's not a math fill in the numeric fill in the blank, but rather it's a, uh, it's a multiple choice math one. And in this case, we can just look at it and we can say, okay, our goal, we have to kind of understand, this is why the content matters, because we have to make sure we understood understand what we're doing. Our goal is 20 units per acre for the entire site. And it's a 330 acre site and 75 have been already developed at 15 units per acre. So given that 75, that some portion of the site has been developed at a less dense than our goal. 15 units per acre is less than obviously 20 units per acre. So our goal is 20 units per acre. Part of it's been developed at 15 units per acre. So we know that the rest of it would have to be developed at something greater than 20 units per acre uh, to get us to 20 units per acre because we're only at 15 units per acre, you know, a quarter of the way in or whatever. So, um, uh, so we know the answer has to be 21. Um, so you don't have to do the math. Now, if you wanted to do the math, those you got, this is why memorization is really not as good a strategy as with understanding. But if you wanted to do the math, it's uh, 15 uh, units per acre. That's what we've developed the portion so far um, times 75 acres divided by 330 acres. So this is, this is how potent it is. And this is the proportion that's that potent. Um, plus uh, some potency for the rest of it and in terms of units per acre uh, times the proportion of the rest of it, 200. There's other ways, of course, to write this same formula, but this is the way that I think is easiest to, to remember. Um, so it's uh, 15 units per acre times the portion of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, um, of the lot that's already developed at 15 units per acre plus X units per acre times the portion of the uh, lot that is going to be developed uh, is equal to our target of 20 units per acre. And if you run that out, um, this winds up being 3.86 plus this winds up being 0.77x. And that's equal to 20. Um, and then you subtract both sides by 3.86 and you Divide by both sides by 0.77, and you get just short of 21 uh, units per acre for the remaining. But most importantly, for our, for our discussion now, um, <laughs> is that a lot of times, a surprising amount of the time, we can solve the uh, we can solve the uh, math equation without even 
you know, with that, with just looking at the, you know, looking at it just in, you know, from the point of view of a smell test. Um, and it's not lost on, you know, back to our kind of content first uh, discussion, it's not lost on me uh, that, um, uh, it's not lost on me that um, uh, we already have over 300 people, uh, including the people in the waiting room, we already have over 300 people, which is a record for this year for sure. And probably it's, we're probably going to hit a record all time by the time I'm done. Um, and it's because people understandably uh, want to know the hack because the thought of a hack is that it's, you know, it's got your best return on investment in terms of your time. I'm just saying that in this particular exam, that's not the case. And we don't really avoid hacks because we, think we're better than that, or we really want you to learn the material because we're paternalistic. It's not that at all. Um, we actually very, we, we would be very pro hack. And back when we used to do ARE 4.0, we included many more hacks. Um, it's just that in ARE 5.0, it's not that useful. Go ahead and answer this question. You have two minutes and 30 seconds to do so. Things you guys are writing on the chat are exactly the kind of the point, right? Someone said that's such an end carb question. Someone said all the answers are in the first, you know, all the answers are in the first paragraph or first sentence. Um, and and um, and so what I want to get across here is um, that okay. So an owner has hired an architect to design a small health clinic in urban brownfield. The owner's priority is lowering operating costs, and the clinic sits in a cold climate. Then it goes on to explain some possibly relevant. But what turns out to be not really relevant um, uh, uh, context of the clinic located in a neighborhood that has changed demographics over several times, several times over the last century. Currently houses working class clientele is, and it is assumed that the catchment area of the region from where the clinic's visit will be pulled will include a mix of single family and multifamily dwellings. Again, that's probably not relevant. Um, uh, it says within, it should say within a seven mile radius, the clinic's founder, a physician from that same neighborhood created the nonprofit that will run the clinic and has recently received a state grant. The clinic has a second mandate to provide pre-parking in the neighborhood. Patients are going to be offered general press check or preventive care. None of that's really relevant. So then the real question is, which of the following should be a priority for the architect? And so we really have, you know, maybe four things that we need to know, it turns out. One is that it's a health clinic, but that's probably a small health clinic. That's maybe relevant. Uh, the fact that it's small means that it is going to be a, probably more likely a skin load dominated building, which means that insulation is going to be more important than a large building that has so much heat gain from people lighting and equipment that generally um, uh, we worry a little bit less about insulation. It's in an urban brownfield. Um, and the owner's priority is lowering operating costs and the clinic sits in a cold climate. So those are probably the four things that are most relevant. Now, um, almost always in these type of questions, there are going to be four things. There'll be a bunch of distractors here, but there are going to be four things that are kind of in play. But one of those four things, almost always, uh, one of those four things, almost always, is going to be. Uh, I'm going to mute all of you. Um, one of these things, almost always, is going to be um, uh, a distractor, which means it's not relevant. So the fact that it's small is somewhat relevant because the answer is installation R value. Um, and in a big building, as I mentioned, that's not as important. Uh, one of the factors is lowering operating costs. Well, that certainly talks about uh, electric lighting and insulation R value. Uh, and the fact that it's a cold climate means that the insulation R value is more important. And you should probably, you know, in interior electric lighting is not a bad answer at all. Uh, in fact, you know, probably 25 years ago, that might have been the right answer. <laughs> it's just that our, our lighting has just gotten so much more efficient. Um, and anyhow, it doesn't really tell us anything that would suggest that electric lighting is really more important than our value. It tells us it's a cold climate um, and it's a small clinic and that that those two things suggest our value. Now, in reality, um, in reality, you know, would interior electric lighting produce, you know, uh, uh, create more more operating costs? Probably not. Not in most cases. Um, percolation rate for septic fields. Um, that kind of somehow, you know, feels like it's about the urban brownfield. The fact that it's a site that has perceived um, uh, perceived um, uh, contamination or actual contamination, but the fact that it's urban 
uh, tells us that um, the percolation, that we're not going to have a septic field. There are no septic fields that I know of in urban sites, or certainly not many, uh, because you have access to municipal, uh, municipal, you would never do a septic field if you didn't have to, if you have access to municipal um, uh, wastewater lines and also uh, 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 sanitary stores. And also, uh, um, usually urban sites don't have enough room for a septic field. So this one's a pretty easy win to cross this one out. This one's a little bit more difficult, but we can kind of cross it out. And the best answer is insulation R value. Um, and if you think that's kind of an unfair question or something like that, again, it's a computer graded exam. So put yourself in their position. I mean, the, the best answer is clearly, and so based on what they've given us, the best answer in most cases is clearly insulation R value. Although certainly one could argue that interior electric lighting is actually a better, and there may be some, Energy models that would tell you uh, lighting is a bigger deal. If you know, if if you said that we we're gonna, if you said the two choices were LEDs, very efficient LEDs, or very inefficient incandescents, but that's not really what the question is asking. Anyhow, the reason that I, uh, the reason that I include that is, you know, let's talk. People always want to ask me when to second guess because, or they want to ask me about second guessing. Um, and the conventional wisdom among the testing community is that you should never second guess yourself. And I actually think that's not good advice. Um, I think you should usually not second guess yourself, but I'll explain to you when you should and when you shouldn't second guess yourself. So uh, I think our aversion to second guessing comes from middle school when the teacher went over the exam. And uh, uh, just as teachers, just as, you know, as always is the case, when you go over an exam, you kind of, you, you kind of distract yourself when the teacher is talking about a problem you got right. You assume that you always chose it right, but a lot of times those questions are ones you originally had wrong, but you changed to right, but you're not really remembering that part of it, right? And then you get to the ones where uh, there were a few questions on the exam probably where it was right originally and you had changed it to the wrong answer. So maybe there were three times when you changed it from the wrong to the right answer, but you don't really remember those. Um, but there's two times where you change it from the right to the wrong answer. And you definitely are like, oh, I should have stuck with my first instinct. I should have stuck with my first instinct. Um, and so um, here's when not to second guess. So a lot of people will tell me that, you know, they're like, but it says urban brownfield. It must have said urban brownfield for a reason. It must have said it for a reason. Otherwise, they wouldn't have told us that. That's not true. There's lots of times where they don't tell you that. Lots and lots and lots of times. Um, so uh, uh, almost always they'll give you four things like this. And one of them is bogus. It's, it's a distractor. It's not relevant. And so you should feel comfortable not second guessing yourself because your insulation R value didn't account for the fact that it's an urban brownfield. That is completely fine, completely fine. Um, I didn't include it here, but almost always also, not almost, always, yeah, almost always in an exam, you'll see a dozen or two dozen questions that has something like this. And then there's an answer that sounds so plausible. Like this one doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make one up on the spot, but there'll be an answer like, uh, an opera, you know, a clinic operating saver or something like that. Some phrase that just sounds like it, it must be perfect for exactly what they've talked about. But importantly, it's never a phrase that you've heard before in all of your studying or all of your practice. And so if you see a if you see a phrase that you've never seen before and it looks really, really like it must be the answer because the words in the answer sound like a thing that should be in here, uh, that, that would be the exact thing. Um, it's almost always a distractor. If you, it's almost always a distractor. If you haven't heard of it and you think it's the right answer because it sounds right, it is not the right answer. So do not second guess yourself because there's something you've never heard of as a choice. And do not second guess yourself because uh, there's a fourth choice. There's a fourth thing that they told you and, you, and, and don't assume that they, they included that for a reason. So um, those are reasons when not to second guess yourself. Um, uh, uh, what are the reasons to second guess yourself? Well, when you kind of look at it again and you say, okay, you had interior electric lighting, but you're like, oh, they did say small and a cold clinic, cold climate. So if it's content-based and you second guess yourself and you think, I think what NCARB is trying to do is they're trying to make sure we understand that when our values are, um, are a reason, you know, are, are, are a primary driver for a decision, um, if there's kind of a logic to it uh, and it's based on you kind of realizing what they're really asking based on the content of the question, by all means, you have my blessing. You should absolutely second guess yourself in that situation because you're likely to get it wrong if you don't. But if you're 
um, overly nervous because of uh, because of some distractor, um, uh, definitely, definitely do not second guess yourself. Um, one way to make yourself not distracted is you can read something like this and you can try to make it so you don't read the choices at the end. Now, this says this sometimes is a good thing, sometimes not. It depends. It, it probably is not a good thing worth a paragraph this long. It's not a bad idea to read the answers at the end so that you make sure it's not about the that there's not something about the uh, you know anti graffiti paint on the on the on the west wall or something like that because that may actually reduce the operating cost. So you in a situation where it's a long passage like this and you want to understand what the context is, looking at the answers might not be a bad idea. But if it's a short question, if it's a one sentence question, and it's asking you something. Um, and you look at that question and you're like, oh, the answer is almost certainly roof shingles. Um, then, then you scroll down and you see that, 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 and you don't, you don't peek and, but it's a short question and you scroll down and you see that the answer, one of the choices is roof shingles, but one of the other choices is something that sounds perfect for that particular description of what they're asking. You know, it's, it's called a, uh, uh, a windshield debugger or something like that. It just sounds like it's exactly because they're asking about debugging a windshield. I don't know why they would ask that. Um, but a car went by and I, I, I panicked and, and, and goofed, but, um, uh, uh, but, um, basically just don't peek. And if the answer choice that you would have given without seeing the available options happens to be one of the available options, you can definitely, definitely answer it and not second guess yourself based on a kind of very specifically named distractor. All right, three of the four, we already talked about that. Um, the fact that um, three of the four are often important and the fourth one is often not. Um, now we're gonna do an interesting little exercise now. Uh, let's say that NCARB wanted you to talk about QAQC, quality assurance, quality control. This is obviously from the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice um, as it relates to BIN. Ben. So go ahead and read this and see if you can come up, you know, you don't have to share it on the chat or you certainly can, but see if you can come up with a good question to cover this content. And I include this because a lot of people will say, how does NCARB want me to answer this? Um, but there's two problems with that. <laughs> um, one is that the, the whole thing is a, uh, um, uh, the whole thing is a, it's not problems with it, but I just think there's a little more nuance to like, oh, if I only understood NCARB's language, um, because one is you kind of feel bad for the person who has to make a multiple choice computer graded question out of this nonsense. Like, how would you, like, you could write something, but for you to have any answer, any answer choices that are reasonable that sound reasonable, but are incorrect as according to uh, the architect's handbook of professional practice, that doesn't really mean it's a bad answer. In other words, you could come up with ridiculous, you could come up with a question like, how do we achieve the quality assurance with BIM? And if one of the choices was we you know, mow the grass at, at six inches, that would be so ridiculous um, uh, that would be so ridiculous that it really wouldn't be a good question. And so a lot of times one of the answers might, one of the answers you might choose if you were writing a question, if you were not experienced at writing questions as these people are not, is, um, you would go through this and you would say like, pick, pick two of the six and you would include two of the things that are in here. And then you would include four other things. And of those four, maybe two or three would sound reasonable. And truth be told, they may be reasonable. In other words, they may be part of a totally legitimate QAQC uh, BIM strategy, but they just weren't listed in the architect's handbook of professional practice. So there is certainly some ways that NCARB, you know, kind of shoots themselves in the foot by creating something uh, by creating something that um, is really, really difficult um, for someone to answer. And people say, oh, that's subjective. It's not subjective. The problem is it's too objective. They're, tr they're trying too closely. They're trying too hard to closely align to one particular book that was not written by God. Um, it was written by human beings. And so um, uh, so there, there, there are distractors, there are alternative answers. Um, just because they're not in the in, in architect's handbook of professional practice does not mean they're unreasonable choices. So on the one hand, yeah, okay, that's how Amber, you know, that's how Amber, that's how NCARB is doing it. But on the other hand, really the best way to deal with how NCARB wants me to answer this, and if you can kind of think that, like, what are they trying to ask, is really this number one thing that you need to understand the content. Um, so if you understand the content, 
you'll be like, okay, it's QAQC. QAQC is really all about kind of um, how the firm looks to the external, not to the internal. So I can eliminate these few. And QAQC is all about um, really formalized procedures that are hopefully measurable. So I can eliminate, eliminate these two and so forth. So that's the goal. If you want to figure out how NCARB wants you to answer it, I'd say just learn the content. It's not easy to just learn the content. There's a lot of content to learn, <laughs> but that's your goal. Your goal is to learn the content. All right, so um, you have, it will work out to be, uh, 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 for any of these exams, it will work out to be um, two minutes per uh, non-case study question. Well, I'll just call them the multiple choice questions, although of course some of them are not multiple choice. Some of them are drag and drop or hotspot or, or um, numerical form of blank. Um, but anyhow, uh, it, for all of those, it'll be about two minutes per, on average, and uh, it'll be about four minutes per on uh, uh, that they, that NCARB has allotted you per case study question. So that's the pace you want to go at. Um, and fortunately, NCARB has six pretty good, and by pretty good, I mean pretty close to the real thing, practice exams that you can use to pace yourself. So you definitely want to pace yourself uh, in an appropriate way at two minutes per. Now, does that mean that you have to take two minutes per question? Of course not. Some questions will take you 45 seconds or even less. Some will take you three or four minutes and that's okay. That's how it's supposed to be. But um, what that means is two or three things. One is if you're so involved in a math problem and that math problem is taking you and would take any reasonable person 15 minutes to solve, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> Maybe you're doing it right, but it's a not, not the most efficient way to do it. Likewise, if you are um, uh, if you are uh, 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 taking thirty minutes to answer a a, a, a case study question, uh, you're probably not doing it right. And it's important to know because of this four minute rule for the case study questions, it's typically not going to be the exception that that like, I'm totally a nerd about tests. Like I'm always the guy who's like one of the last ones or the last one to leave the room because I check everything like six times. I'm completely obsessive about this stuff, and um, and so I'm the kind of person that if it asks a code question and there's a code table uh, followed by a bunch of um, explanations and exceptions to the, to the code rule, I'll look at the table and I'll say, ah, it should be, uh, it's an uh, accessory, or it's a, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a use group, it's an industrial use group. And then I'll be like, but maybe it's not. I better read all of these exceptions. <laughs> um, and I'll start reading all the exceptions. And that's probably not worth it because NCARB doesn't really, um, well, they do actually, it's ironically, they do in some of the use groups, like the way that a large, the way that a large, uh, a large classroom building a, a room, uh, like a lecture hall in a university is, is assembly and not educational, or the way that a daycare can be anything from residential to institutional to educational. There are definitely some exceptions that show up on the use group. But in general, let's say I found out that it was 75 feet, uh, to the, you know, maximum to the exit to the egress or something. Um, I would not, it is not a good use of your time. If you're in any kind of a hurry, it is not a good use of your time to read the 10 paragraphs afterward that explain that in a uh, pillow packing plant, uh, that 75 feet goes down to 35 feet or something like that. It's just not, NCARB doesn't do that to us because they understand it's a, it's a, it's a case study for a timed exam and that would not be reasonable. So if you have the answer uh, and you think you have the answer from the table, uh, you don't have to read all the exceptions. Uh, the, for the case studies, uh, just, you know, so not much longer, not much more, longer than two minutes. And actually with a two minute rule, I mean, there's a lot of debate whether to do the case studies first or the, um, or the, you know, the, I'll call it the multiple choice first. It is a no brainer to do the multiple choice first. Um, and the reason it's a no brainer is because every question is worth the same. The case studies are worth the same as a multiple choice. And so if you're going to run out of time and you're going to, and the exams, you're going to have, you're going to need 10 minutes more to finish the exam than you are than you have available, um, would you rather miss two questions in the case study or five questions in the multiple choice? And the answer of course is you'd rather run out of time with two questions left than with five questions left given that the case studies take more time. Now, if you've already taken three or four of these exams and you never run out of time, you always have an hour and a half left, then by all means, it's up to you. 
but if you are, if there's any chance that you're going to run out of time, it makes no sense to me to do the case studies first. So our advantages, um, and we'll talk about them a little later to doing them first, if you're not worried about running out of time, but if running out of time is in the cards, potentially, um, then you definitely don't want to, don't want to do the case studies first. Um, if for the case studies, one third of the case studies, fully one third of the case study questions, if you've been studying and doing a good job, uh, one third of the case studies, you will know the answer without having to look at the case study reference material. It'll ask you something about uh, mechanical systems and you'll be like, oh, that's a VAV system they're describing. And um, in that case, trust yourself. Uh, just answer it as a VAV system. You knew it was. It always will be when you go look it up. And if you don't totally trust yourself, you can flag it. And if you have time later, you can get back to it. But wouldn't it be a shame? Uh, in my experience, if you know, if when I know the answer and then I, I answer it, but then I go go through the case study reference material, 100% of the time, it's the answer I knew to begin with. Because I know, you know, okay, NCARB's trying to figure out here if I understand that a VAV system has less ductwork than a, than a single zone system, a bunch of single zones, uh, air handling units. Um, so you can trust yourself. Um, for especially the PA exam, but some of the others, you want to think like a banker. Um, so this is very hard for people. I don't know how to tell you to think like a banker other than just think like a banker. Like, so, I mean, just remember that there are, uh, uh, you could have a project, say it's a speculative office building that's 10 stories tall. If the building is laid out efficiently, in other words, if uh, your net to gross is is 70%, meaning 70% of the uh, of the floor area, let's, uh, let's say 70% of the, let's, let's say, sorry, 90%, uh, I'm going to pick an extreme example that probably is not achievable, but let's say 90% of the floor area is net, in other words, is rentable, um, and net and rentable do mean different things, I know, um, but, but basically the efficiency of the floor layout is such that that the landlord, that the owner, that the, 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 the developer is going to be making a lot of money per square foot. Um, that may mean that they're going to make $10 million on this project. Uh, but if you lay out really generous, uh, really generous uh, elevator lobbies and, and entrances, and uh, you have a bunch of, you know, really generous bathrooms and that kind of thing, uh, some of the, the common corridors that may not be rentable, um, then it could be that the developer is going to lose $2 million. So the architect, but based on how efficient she lays out the plan uh, is maybe the difference. I'm not exaggerating for a building, maybe the difference between making $10 million on the project and losing $2 million on the project. So, um, so you want to kind of think like a banker. So if they ask you questions about like life cycle cost analysis um, and so for life cycle cost analysis, especially for things like uh, um, curtain walls and exterior finishes, because those degrade over time, or uh, things like lighting and mechanical systems, because they use energy over time. Um, sometimes the cheapest option is actually a more expensive construction cost, because over the life of the light fixture or air handling unit or chiller or curtain wall, um, uh, the uh, um, the maintenance is enough less or the uh, the energy use is enough less that it actually is a no-brainer even in net present dollars. So you have to be able to think like that. Now, again, if you can't think like that, I don't know what to tell you. I don't you know, other than going to get a master's degree in business or something. Um, but I think most of us can kind of put on that hat and say, okay, we're trying to make money here. Uh, so let's let's be kind of cold and calculating about the money situation. And they usually are pretty clear when they want you to do talk about money. They'll say, what's the least expensive option or, you know, given life cycle cost, whatever. I mean, there are questions about life cycle cost and 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 uh, expenses. You know, what's the cheapest or most expensive options are literally the worst questions they have on this exam. Uh, they are so simplified and they're so often wrong. Um, and there's not really any. Uh, other than reading a couple of textbooks, and I have some here somewhere, um, there's not really, a, and even reading those, it's not that helpful. Like it's really hard to, it would take just so much time to memorize the relative cost of everything. Um, but where you can, you want to think like a banker. And along those same lines, if they're asking what's cheaper and you will get questions asking what's cheaper, what's least expensive in some version or another, um, uh, uh, the, what, you know, a lot of times you won't know the answer, but one of the hacks is whatever you see the most, um, uh, is the cheapest. So if one of the choices is OSB and it's a, you know, stick construction and you think, oh, 
I do see a lot of OSB in stick construction, then OSB is the cheapest. If one of the choices is EFIS and it's a shopping center and you think, oh, there are a lot of the crappy shopping centers I see have EFIS on them, have you know kind of crappy stucco, um, uh, then that is the cheapest. Um, the other ways to know if it's the cheapest are things that are less processed, uh, are less refined, are and less beautiful often, <laughs> are often cheaper. So, um, uh, so laminate is often cheaper than hardwood flooring. You know, full you know thickness hardwood flooring, full wood thickness. Um, uh, uh, vinyl is you know vinyl trim is cheaper than uh, wood. Um, uh, uh, steel is cheaper than stainless steel because it's more refined and so forth. So usually if you just kind of step back and say, okay, you know, which would, which would be found in a, which would be found in a fancy museum and which would be found in a crappy shopping center. Um, that can answer a lot of your, a lot of, and this, and that's one of the places, this is the, which is cheaper thing and the code are, are two of the areas where people with more experience do much better than people with less experience. Um, but uh, overall, people who are more recently out of college actually have a higher pass rate because they're, I think, studying is just easier for them because they're used to it. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, what's most common is cheaper. There's a lot of debate over whether to take a break or how many breaks to take, or I guess you only get one. But um, I, I wouldn't take a break if you don't have to. And the reason, of course, is because uh, anything that you've answered, uh, and there are tricks to opening one case study question so you can still have an answering that but not the other so you can still have access to the case study questions you might do something like that but in general it's three four hours i would try to power through it it's not you know it's not coal mining um i would try to power through it so you have access to the of course many of you guys know this already but um uh, oftentimes i mean a surprising amount of times the case study material has an has an answer to some of the multiple choice uh, questions you saw earlier. So you may be asked something multiple choice earlier. That's about something in the code. And then there's a code excerpt in the case study material that you can now check and do a search for that particular uh, uh, that particular code item. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's there. I can't believe they did that. Well, they do that all the time. I think they just don't know when they're assembling the when they're assembling the uh, questions. They don't they don't you know they don't go through it that carefully. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, so you want to have access for sure to the case study materials while you still have access to the multiple choice materials. And if you take a break for obvious reasons, you can't look at the questions anymore because they don't know where you went in the break. Uh, especially if you're taking it at home, right? They don't know where you went. You could have gone and looked up some of that stuff. So any of the questions you opened, you are not going to be able to answer. So if you better, if you are going to take a break, you better answer every question that you open before you take that break, because those questions will be marked wrong. Um, and so I would say, don't take a break now, don't take a break. And I'm going to put a little asterisk here because obviously if you really have to pee or you're really cramping up or your mind is totally mush or you're starving or whatever, you, you know, yourself, I mean, if you just can't get through it, then by all means, take a break. If you think you're going to do better by taking a break than not taking a break, um, then, maybe answer one of each of the two case study questions. So at least you have access to the case study material later. But the problem again with taking that break is any other questions you answered, you're not gonna be able to change when you see the case study uh, reference material. You're not gonna have that advantage. Um, and of course, and, and I put these at the bottom uh, because I'm uh, not because it's less useful, but because I think people know this anyway, but you can flag the questions and then go back and look at the flagged questions. And finally, um, there is a search function in the case studies and it's still not good, but it's gotten better. Um, it's still, some of the drawings are last I checked are still kind of giving people trouble when they try to search for text with the, the, uh, vector-based drawings. But, um, but there's a search function and I think, I don't, I think these days I don't have to explain this to you guys that much. There was a time where I had to explain to people over a certain age that if they were doing a search, they should do a search for the least common word, right? So if the, if it's zoning and uh, uh, and if it's zoning um, and it's for uh, 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 a pizza restaurant, um, it, try searching for pizza first. And if nothing comes up, then look look for restaurant. That's a bad example, but you get the idea. Search for the less common phrasing first, because usually in the case study questions, they will phrase it not not always, but most of the time. They will phrase it in the exact same way that it's located in the, for instance, the zoning or the code. So if they say something like, um, uh, 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 
uh, exit access or something like that, some phrase like that, then you can search for that same phrase, that exit access phrase, and likely that you're going to be able to see uh, that phrase actually pop up a few times. Now, I'm going to go really quickly through some study hacks. Um, the most important thing you can do right now, by far the, you know, I talk to people all the time who are taking these exams, and I cannot tell you how many people, and surely some of you guys out there are in this boat, how many people took a couple of exams, you know, three, four years ago, and then they got really busy at work, and then they had a kid, and then they had a sick parent, uh, and then they just forgot everything they had studied. And so uh, the most important, uh, the most important correlation uh, between getting licensed and any decision you can make today is to get the exams on your calendar, on your calendar. And it's really lucky that NCARB no longer charges you to move the exams. So if you're not ready, you just postpone them if you need to. But at least getting them on the calendar is by far the most important thing. We're a subscription service. We do better if you just, you know, if you take forever to get these done. But that's not really what drives us. Um, and we want you to get licensed. That's kind of what drives us. And so um, not having the exams on your calendar is sometimes, uh, I would say, is the number one reason why people who would otherwise, you know, be able to get licensed don't get licensed. Um if you're going to, I don't think you have to write notes while you're studying, but if you're going to, to get the most out of them, by far, you'll get 10 times as much out of them if, if you put things in your words and not in my words. Um, for um, uh, for questions like this one that we saw, where it was really, really long, um, uh, uh, there are a large cohort of you guys who just get just can't read this much. Like They read this much, and you're trying to figure out what you're doing, because as you're reading, you're saying... Um, your, your mind is doing four things at the same time. You're, you're changing the letters into, into words, um, and you're changing the words into meaning, but then you're also, so that's two things, but then you're also identifying the important words. So, um, small health clinic, urban brownfield, lowering operating cost, cold climate. So you're identifying those as you're reading <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, and you're trying to remember those. So as you're continuing to turn the words into meaning and going along, you come across small health clinic, you identify it, and in your head, you're going small health clinic, small health clinic, small health clinic, and you continue to read and you're going urban brownfield, urban brownfield, urban brownfield. Um, and then you continue to read and you're uh, lowering operating costs, lowering operating costs, and you continue to read cold climate, cold climate. Um, and so there's four things that you're doing. Now, if you're if your English is a second language, you're doing six things, maybe. Uh, you may be translating it back to your native tongue and then translating it back to English for as you're going. So um, it's like a four track or a six track mind. Um, and it turns out, uh, and we know this because uh, we created something called Olive Book, which is a, a it's similar to Amber Book, but it's for folks who are um, uh, folks who are looking to study for the SAT and the ACT. And so we got we did a deep dive into trying to understand how people get better at reading comprehension. And it turns out that the way to get better at reading comprehension is to read. <laughs> so it's a muscle. It won't take you as long as you think to get better at things like this. So if you read uh, every, if you leave the phone in the kitchen and you bring a book to bed um, or a magazine to bed or something, and, and you read every night and you don't have to read, you don't have to study uh, while you're reading and you don't have to fight it when you start getting drowsy, just go to sleep. Um, but if you read at night, um, after six weeks, you will start getting better at long passages like this. And after six months, you'll be quite good at it. This will not create a problem for you anymore. Um, for most of you guys who have no trouble reading all this, most likely you're either a reader or your English is a first language or more likely you're both. And so uh, if you have trouble with this kind of thing, and if you have a long view, uh, I would leave the phone and start reading at night. And actually, since I've been recommending this to people, I've gotten, I've heard back from several people who say like, you know, I passed the exams, but now I keep reading at night. My husband's so mad at me because he misses when he used to watch TV, but I can't get, you know, I can't stop. I'm sleeping an extra 45 minutes a night because I'm not watching true crime right before bed. Um, and, uh, and I really, really love it. So, and I'm never, never going to stop. So anyhow, really recommend you reading. Um, we're going to put something in the chat right now. Um, it's a uh, adult, adult logic puzzle. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the PA, <laughs> content is logic. And I don't know how to train you on logic, really. Um, but I've, I have found a logic puzzle book for adults. And so um, you can do this logic puzzle book. People have told me it's been very helpful for them. Um, logic puzzles, though, are one of those things where they just seem like these types of things just seem so obvious to me. 
um, that I don't really know how to teach them. Uh, they just like, it's like, Oh, okay. The, you know, the, the, you know, there are four kids and one of them has a green shirt. One has a yellow, one has a blue and one has a, a purple. And, um, and you know, that, uh, uh, you know, Jeremy's favorite color is, blue, is, is Jeremy hates blue. So you can know that, okay, that Jeremy does not have a blue shirt <laughs> and likewise in PA they'll, they'll show you these, you know, diagrams, these bubble diagrams and where there's a line between two, if this is the lobby and this is the movie theater, if there's a line between them, that means they're adjacent to one another. Um, importantly, this is a hack that I forgot to mention. There could be something near both of them, but if there's only a line to the lobby and that's the restrooms, that does not mean the restrooms need to be near the movie theater just because it happens to be near on this bubble diagram. It means the lobby has to be adjacent to the restrooms, restrooms have to be adjacent to the lobby, but there's nothing here that suggests that the restrooms have to be near the movie theater. Um, and so, uh, but when you, when you see one of these and they have a bunch of blank bubbles and it says, you know, it asks you, you know, you know, where's the restroom located? It has a whole bunch of bubbles that are, you know, um, uh, that are, you know, that are kind of like this and, and you have to figure out what the different room adjacencies are. Um, it's essentially just a logic puzzle. And of course, a lot of it's common sense and a lot of it is like, no, duh. And a lot of it is. Um, kind of oversimplified, like it's kind of a stupid, frankly, way to test architects. We understand how to do these things anyway. We understand adjacencies. We don't need them to create a logic puzzle for us. But PA has a, you know, PA exam is very kind of logic puzzly. Um, and if you're struggling with those, you might do, uh, 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 you might do uh, uh, the, the adult logic puzzles. Go ahead and order that book. I've never used that book. So I don't, I can't recommend it firsthand, but people tell me it's good. <laughs> Stop being anxious. I know that's easy to say, um, but I, a lot of the people I talk to are just so just nervous about everything. Um, and it's just so unuseful. I, I get it. I mean, I understand these are high stakes tests. It's your career. It's some ways, you know, for some of you, it's your self-worth and so forth. Um, but you need to get, you need to do whatever you can to get past the anxiety. And maybe ex exercise is a great way to do it. Eating right, hanging out with friends, um, uh, uh, hanging out with family. Uh, just going easy on yourself generally, um, because experiencing failure in advance is just not an effective way to study for these exams. Um, and that brings me to my last thing, which is, you know, I, when I when I first started talking to people uh, one on one about these exams, I, I took for years, actually, I took a like a tough love approach. Like people would say, like, you know, I'm just so worried about this. And I'd be like, you know, we were going to talk about content. We're going to talk about study strategies. We're going to, you know, I'm not going to get into what you're upset about. We're going to, we're going to be like kind of results oriented. And, and I still do that somewhat. I'm not the most empathetic human being, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm fairly empathetic. And I have seen uh, enough people with just ridiculously tight neck muscles, you know, they get on the screen and I'm like, oh my gosh, man, you just look so stressed out. And they're just, their body language and their voice and everything about them is miserable which would not be a big deal if this was going to take, you know, three months, like we can all be miserable for three months, but, it, but the people who are most miserable, of course, are the ones who have been doing this for seven, eight years. And um, I just don't think that any of us on our deathbed or want to look back at like a decade of our life or five years of our life and let the exam make us miserable because when you pass the exam, you're not going to be happy for that long. You'll be happy, but not for that long. And so it just does not make any sense uh, to be miserable for years. So make a choice not to. It's hard when you're in the middle of it to do that. But, you know, again, you know, kind of live your life as you will and try to approach these uh, studying for these exams, taking these exams with some sense of joy, joy some sense of curiosity, some sense that they're going to make you a better architect. All right. All right, guys. Good night. Get licensed. <laughs>